All right. So at this time, we're going to be looking at some res some research methods. And I wanted to direct your attention back to our slide presentation. So here we have a model for how to generate critical thinking about your topic. OK, so the research is supposed to work through the topic, as we said in the last video, kind of the logical progression of how you're going to tell it. Right? You're trying to answer the specific questions, especially in an informative speech. You're trying to answer the what, describe it, when, tell, tell the time frame, who, tell the subject and the object, where, build um, a picture of the environment, and perhaps why and how, okay? So descriptive, and then um, you'll go into analytical. As you are describing, you're gonna get down to kind of to the nitty gritty of um, how. And in fact, as far as an informative speech, for some people, that may be what your speech consists of, is a how-to. It may be something that you enjoy, something you're passionate about, and you want to share with others what you have learned. So, for example, I could potentially, if I was uh, giving an informative speech, I would talk about language, death, and revitalization. My passion, my research has been a lot in um, indigenous languages and how they survive in dominant language uh, cultures. And that is true across the world. You know, there are over 7,000 languages in the world. And yet 90% of the world only speaks right a few some of the dominant languages in the world are of course english whether it's english um that uh in here in the united states or in england where people were born and, and speak it natively or there's world english that is becoming a huge trade language um it is dominating technology right if you work in technology then you have to have some handle on language uh if you are in business or trade, you need to have a business English. Um, if you are in education, right, in higher ed, um, many universities across the world are going to um, where much of the content is delivered in English. And this includes Europe, right, like Norway, Holland, places like that. Um, you have them having their own native language, but at the university level, many of the lectures are presented in English because there's such a diversity in the, in the student population that there is an inability to accommodate all the different people and all the different languages. Same thing in China, right, or Japan. Uh, students learn English and many of the lectures are given um, in English, even in China and Japan. Uh, so another dominant language, of course, is Spanish. Um, it's fast approaching to be the second most dominant language in the world. Uh, third one is Mandarin, right? There's a large percentage of the population um, of the world that speaks Mandarin, and they dominate many of the other minority languages that, that exist within the Far East uh, Asia continent, right? Whether it's Mongolian or um, uh, Xinjiang, um, many of the many other, other like small languages in that Far East area 
Um, we can talk about the Hmong. Uh, and I can go on and on about how many different minority languages exist there that are kind of forced out and forced towards speaking only the Mandarin um, that is like, you know, universal in that part of the world. Russia, the same thing. Across this, what used to be the old Soviet Union, um, Russia was the standard language, you know, from uh, the Urals, from Finland, all the way to Alaska. And it doesn't matter what the other uh, native language, whether it's Chechen or Kazakh or, um, you know, any number, um, Uzbek, um, Aleut, Inuit, it doesn't matter what the other minority languages are, everyone was required to speak Russian. So you have this dynamic in South America. You have the same thing going on from Mexico all the way down um, throughout Central America, throughout South America. You have where Spanish and then in Brazil, Portuguese is the dominant language. And you have all these other indigenous languages that um, kind of crowded out. All right. So if I was to give an informative speech about that, I would talk about, you know, what is the language? Um, how does this happen? Is it a process, right? How, um, and then we could talk about colonialization. Uh, we could talk about um, how the language becomes important in order to make money, right? Where business and money is the most important thing. And so um, for many people, you know, it's more important to make a, a living than it is to preserve their cultural heritage and, uh, or, in other words, the pressures of the world exert this kind of tension where they have to make those kinds of choices, right? Where, I just gave you a where, you know, you can look at different um, dynamic, uh, dominant versus minority languages in different parts of the world. The why um, usually it has to do with um, power building, right? Empire building, um, control. I talked a little bit about the how, how, um, you know, trade relations are built. And then um, the, the interests of trade and the interests of business overtake. And so people are forced into having to speak these dominant languages. My personal opinion, um, I promote what I call a healthy bilingualism or a healthy multilingualism where you learn the dominant language, you, um, you interact and you, uh, you do what you have to do, you know, to survive and be a healthy, successful um, contributor to a, the global society. But at the same time, you work very hard to preserve your unique cultural heritage and language. Um, then you ask the, you know, the kind of the evaluative questions, right? What if all these languages died out? Um, so what, why, why is preserving someone's cultural language or heritage that important? You know, it, it's not like anything important they ever did or said. And then that's where you go into actually, you know, there's valuable cultural information that can never be replaced that is treasured and stored in these, uh, in different languages. And so that is an essential part of um, preserving, you know, there, for example, you have flora and fauna in the northern part of South America, in the rainforest, you have particular kinds of natural resources that can only be found in these areas. And the knowledge of what they are and how they're useful can only be found in the, the, the language of the people who live in that area and who have interacted with these plants on a personal daily basis for hundreds of years. 
right? So that's an example of why or the so what, you know, why is it important? And then the what next is what steps can we take in order to preserve, right? So basically you're going back, your informative speech is gonna answer more a descriptive kind and perhaps a little bit of analysis. Um, the evaluative part is where is our third speech where we get into more persuasion and trying to change people's mind. An informative speech isn't so much to change people's mind as to raise awareness, right? Let people know this is important. Usually I tell people that an informative speech should be on a, an important scientific or historic topic, okay? An important scientific or historic topic. And using that, um, your, your focus is on descriptive, right? Your, and one of the best ways to describe, as I showed in, in that last video, is telling the story, right? Telling the story. Um, and take a particular instance. Tell the who. Tell the where. Tell the when. And by telling those stories of the who, where, and when, you're 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 inviting your audience to experience what the subject has experienced right um and so that's why we you know that's a reason for using that style all right let's go on to our next topic here which is finding information all right so you've got an idea of what you want to talk about. You've got an idea. Um, in our in our book, The Essential Guide to Public Speaking by Quentin Schultz, the research topic and the audience, in chapter eight, we start thinking about um, the topic and how it applies to our audience. Um, we have an idea. Um, usually I tell people, first of all, tell what you know, right? Secondly, you don't know everything. So you're not, you're not only building your speech off of uh, what you know, but you are also building your speech off of, um, you're also building your speech off of what you are learning. So you start with what you know, but then you want to back it up with authoritative information, okay? You start with what you know, but then you want to back it up with authoritative information. Let me share with you here um, my window that I was uh, trying to show you. All right. So here uh, in the Quentin Schultz book, Guide to Public Speaking, Chapter 8, you have thought about what you want to say. You are now, as you're serving your audience, you're, you're thinking about your audience and what they need or want to hear. What is something that is relevant? Something that you're passionate about, but that is relevant to them, right? A how-to, perhaps, but a little bit deeper, okay? Um, your goal is, did I say that? I'm, I'm not sure if I said that, but your goal is a five, uh, for the informative speech is five to seven minutes. I usually use the rule of thumb where uh, you can speak, a person speaking at an average pace are gonna speak about 200 words per minute. So a five to seven minute speech is gonna be between 1250 and 1500 words. If you are writing your, word, your speech out word for word and you have 200 and 50 words per page, double spaced. That's about five to six typed 
double spaced pages. Okay, that's just a little rule of thumb that might help you. All right, so the information that you provide um, it should be researched, it should be relevant, right? It should speak to your audience, but it should be reputable information. Now, my third point is triage of information. And this is where we're coming to the research part of it. Okay, I call this triage of information because um, there is so much information available in our world today that you have to decide. You have to cut down. You have to decide what is important. It's kind of, um, for those of you that have any kind of medical experience, know what an, e, uh, an emergency room is like. Um, a person comes in and they have a lot of problems with them, right? They're not breathing. Um, their their pulse is very shallow. They're bleeding, and um, the 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 skin on one leg is kind of scraped. All right. So, what's the most important thing? Well, most important thing is get the, get the breath back, right? So you start um, rescue breaths. The breathing is very what they call agonal. Um, you get the breathing going. Um, their heart starts pumping, getting oxygen down. Now you got to deal with the blood flow so that they don't lose too much blood. Um, and then you can start after you have taken care of those life threatening aspects, then you can deal with more surface things like cuts, abrasions um, and things like that. Same thing with, uh, um, with your information. All right, what is essential? What do you need to communicate to your audience? What is going to get the point across and You've only got five to seven minutes to say it. So what is the most important thing to say in those five to seven minutes? Right. So um, as you um, you take. All right. I'll show you kind of what I do. Um, I take a. A piece, of, you know, a, a legal pad. Actually, I, a lot of times I do something much bigger than that. Let me give you a, a little bit of a. A picture here of what I do. Um, I'll be right back. So one of my favorite mediums is these big desktop calendars, right? They are probably six by 30 something like that maybe 24 by 30 36 and um i love it because there's so much space on it right and i will start um, making a list you know different things um what have i learned what have i studied uh, and then i'll like write big big main points um, and then I will add in extra notes as I think of them. A lot of times I'll write in um, different color pins. Um, I'll come back and add to it. Um, here I was building an idea about... Um, effective or effectual grace, right? And how power, the idea of effect comes from the idea of an energy source, power, right? And then empowering others, how Christ um, was effectual, his grace is effectual, and how he used his power to empower others, power, power with God, right? I, I, you know, so one idea led to another, which led to another. And I've got little um, thoughts all over empowering others, spiritual abuse, religious trauma, mental health, religious instigation, things like that, right? So I use these big pads, and I just start writing as, as quickly um, everything that comes to my mind about this topic. And then, um, then I will come back 
and I will prioritize, okay? Which things can be learned together, right? I love using brackets. I love using um, marks. I love using arrows, right? This is first. Then I come back and say, okay, um, so this idea is first. This idea is second. Um, this idea is third. This is kind of under it. So this is um, 3A, and this is 3B. Um, power structures in Christianity, that's kind of like this, but it's different. Um, and actually, this probably comes to our spiritual abuse. Um, studying these power structures, um, what's the difference between the power of God versus the power that he has delegated to people who represent him in religion? Um, you know, this is going to be another major point. So I break it down. Uh, and organize, all right? At this point, then you're going to begin to notice, okay, I have got the what and the where, but I don't have the when and the who, right? Or, you know, whichever one we happen to be on at that point, right? So that, that provides gaps in the knowledge that I have, all right? And again, I have to keep in mind, this is only a five to seven minute speech. So I'm going to have to um, prioritize. I'm going to have to triage of from all the information that is available on the internet, what is the most important. All right, so finding and evaluating online sources. Um, Briefly review the material on the website of the top five links provided by two or three different search engines, right? You can use Bing, Google, DuckDuckGo, whatever search engine. Of course, I would recommend that we, um, you as um, good little William Carey students, you can always go to um, our William Carey library. Libguides dot carry guides dot carry dot edu. All right, we come here. This brings us to our major. Um, I am still working on this idea of um language revitalization. So I am going to put that in here. Now, if I did just language, let's, let's look at that for a minute. If I just said language, you know how much I'm going to get back? Well, you can imagine. You've probably seen it. Um, 12,865,449 articles. All right, we need to narrow that down a little bit. What about language revitalization? All right, let's try that. Let's the more terms in your search in your search, the fewer examples you're going to have. Okay, that brings us down to only 80,771 sources. Okay? I want to do even narrower than that. Language revitalization in Brazil. Okay, that's still, that narrowed it down, but it's still a huge topic. And then I can come down to and say, okay, let's narrow the time limit, right? This is everything that we, that has been written over the last 80 years. What about just the last five years, right? 2015 to 2020, okay? I only want academic journals. I don't want all these other ones. That narrows it down to 2,000. Okay. Um, academic actually narrows it down to 700. Um, I can also narrow it down a little bit further. You notice that your first one is in English. For some of you, your second one um, you noticed was in Foi no Português. Não é? Então, no, o português é in, importante, mas vocês, um, algumas não falam o português. Então, uh, o português vai ser um pouco difícil 
for the sesh. And so for that reason, then you should um, probably narrow down the language, right? We're going to eliminate Portuguese, um, Russian, Spanish. Um, if you did it in Spanish, if you did your research in Spanish, you could come up with three key articles, all right? You can, you can actually deal with three articles, right? You could um, read each one of them, obsolescence, obsolencia linguistica. You could actually um, look at the obsolescence or the disappearance, you know, the death of languages and um, talk about that even as it has to do with Brazil, but perhaps from the perspective of one of the countries that border on Brazil, right? Like per Peru or Colombia or Venezuela um, or Argentina, right? One of those. Um, so you have this possibility of narrowing down your research, okay? Um, and so just keep narrowing down until you get, and even then, even if you get it narrowed down, okay, let me turn off the Spanish for a second. Where was I? Let's see. I wanted to clear that that one um, thing. Oh, there it is. Clear that. Come back to. Okay, so you've got seven hundred. All right. Obviously, you're not going to use them all. Um, but this is maybe drilling down a little bit more to what you're talking about, but what exactly? Then you can start, and I, I hate to say it, but you have to judge articles by their titles, right? At this point, um, you don't have time to read all 700 of them, so you're going to have to get an idea of some key words that you're wanting to do. Are you wanting to look at language policy, right? What is government doing about in in about encouraging um, minority languages to thrive in their country? What is Brazil specifically doing to encourage minority languages to thrive in their country? Um, we could talk about ethnicity. What is the process of ethnicity? How do people maintain this idea of an ethnicity by through a shared language? You know, and you could just focus on just that aspect, right? Ethnolinguistic identity. So if we were doing that, then we'd um, pick number four, right? We're gonna add that one to our folder. Um, we're gonna skip on down, skip on down, skip on down. Um, ethnic identity, there's another one. Um, we're gonna add that one to our folder. Skip on down, skip on down. Um, let's see, go on to the next page, right? Um, American Indigenous Languages and Cultures, Advocates, University Libraries as Advocates. All right, what can we do, right? What can a university library do? What can William Carey do to encourage the preservation of indigenous languages in their collections, right? Again, this is a, this is a topic, um, this isn't, so that's a different topic. Right, it's not talking about the the ethnic identity. It's talking about us as academics, as people in the university. What can we do? And that sounds actually more of a persuasive topic, right? Not explaining what ethnicity is or and how that ethnicity process works to um, hold on to and to value the language, but rather what can we do? Um, we may be running out of things that deal specifically with our major topic. All right, we've already chosen two. If we could find one more good one. Um, and there's all kinds of interesting ideas that you're running past, right? All kinds of, but you can't talk about all of them. You're, you're focusing, you're trying to discipline yourself 
to focus on only certain particular important one ideas that you feel and usually the way a library search engine works is it prioritizes the most relevant ideas to the top right so the further away you get the less relevant um, this is going to be um, So this actually, even though it doesn't exactly have the same um, search events, this idea of indigenous peoples and monolingualism would be relative, relevant, right? Um, and so I'm going to add that to my art, to my folder. All right, now I can come up here to my folder, and what do I find? I've got three decently chosen articles. All right, so I'm basically going to say, okay, these are my ideas. Um, this makes me think of this. Um, I'm going to get my um, get my information from this. After I read about a third of it, it's like, okay, this isn't exactly what I had in mind. Find similar results so I can keep digging. Or the other thing I could do is I'm actually going to read it. Um, I'm going to find, okay, so I don't, the whole article doesn't help me, but there is a couple of really good quotes in this article, and then they have a works cited page at the end of this article, and it mentions this article, right? So it actually points me to another article that seems to me more relevant. So at that point, I can follow that. And so... It may take you a while to follow the trail of the topic that you're trying to find, but you're trying to fill in these gaps, right? Of what you do, what you do know and what you don't know. And you're trying to fill it in with quality information, right? Reputable information, valuable information, information that will, um, actually deal with what you're trying to say. You can consult with research experts. So our, our book, you know, gives us some other tips. Consult with research experts, right? Find somebody in the field that you respect. Watch a YouTube video. I love watching YouTube videos. There are so many um, valuable, important, quality lectures um online i'm not talking about um some um you know some um twitch gamer who is trying to get 20,000 likes and so post a crazy video right that's not the that's not the quality that we're going for here right um, I'm talking about somebody who is authoritative in the field, who knows what they're do, what they have to say, who is has used their voice, um, and has spoken to you and ed, and trying to educate you, and you're trying to educate yourself by listening to them, right? You can ask your librarians. We've got a great librarians here. Go to the head librarian. Um, he is excellent he's wise he knows what it, his business um he listens and he's very helpful um if you need help here at William K. you can come to me and talk about it so when you're looking at public websites you're only going to um see that which is most rel um most popular right Google is specifically engineered not to find what is most relevant, but to find what is most popular when people do this search, right? When people do this search, when they, they put these particular search terms in, and then they click on a link, what is the most popular link that they click based on those search terms? 
that's how they prioritize their search. So their search is prioritized on, on what is popular. Our research may not be what is the most popular thing, right? It may be very specific. Um, it may be slightly obscure, but something that is important that we have seen and yet that hasn't got a lot of popularity or a lot of um, a lot of uh, um, public uh, recognition. And so because of that, then we need to be aware of that, right? Evaluate the credibility of secondary sources. You know, is this source reputable? Um, how do we know that they're reputable? Um, check their, um, there are a lot of quotes. Here's another one. A lot of memes. It says, you know, um, Confucius say, and they'll have this quote of Confucius, and then you go back and look. Well, it wasn't actually Confucius. It was somebody else. It was Sun, Sun Tzu, and it was attributed to Confucius, right? Or another one. Um, C.S. Lewis said, and then you go back and read. If you actually went back and read the C.S. Lewis book, you would realize that he, he didn't come up with this idea. He's simply quoting from G.K. Chesterton. And then G.K. Chesterton and on back it is, right? There's other really popular um, quotes. I, find, I run across this all the time. Uh, Shakespeare said, but then you go back and you realize, oh, Shakespeare was quoting from Ovid a uh, Latin poet from the first century, right? Ovid didn't write a lot of original. He was actually quoting from a Homer or Hesiod, right? And, and so on and so forth. How do you know the, the actual source of quotations? And, you know, there's this long line of history, and we can't get to the bottom of it. If you can find a decently qualified source, at least tell what source you use and please whenever i say that don't say i got it from google right that's not a source google is not a source google is simply a search engine that points you to many many googles of sources google is not a source um avoid fabrication unfortunately it happened just this week. Person giving a speech, giving a very important speech, um, said the Bible said, and then they gave a bogus Bible citation. Right? They said it right there. It says in, you know, this book, this chapter, this verse. They weren't even in the right region of the Bible. Right. They said that the quotation that they were making was from Isaiah. It was from the book of James, right? Completely, it, the difference between the Old Testament, New Testament, difference between a prophet and an apostle, um, difference between addressed to um, a people in exile versus a people um, in, um, in diaspora, you know, it, Anyway, so be honest, avoid fabrication, identify plagiarism, right? Tell what you think and what you believe, and then tell where you got your other sources, right? Back up what you say, be trustworthy. Um, we're going to stop there on the research if you have more specific questions, please do use our text. Um, but remember, you're, you're trying to convey information, a descriptive, but also in, do it in the form of storytelling. I, um, to me, storytelling is, is vital for getting information across. If you're gonna con connect with your audience, if you're gonna serve them, if you're gonna give speeches that actually make a difference in their lives, 
I believe it has to be in the form of storytelling. And so incorporate your information in a story format if possible. Give the statistics. Give the um, actual uh, scientific explanations and reasons, but also tell it in a way that is accessible so that your audience can be blessed. All right. Uh, with that, we're going to close out. And uh, come back to our home page. And thank you for 